You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Hello and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Matt Clark. With over 10 years experience making records, Matt is a freelance producer and engineer specializing in all types of heavy music. In the past, he has worked at Deaf Wolf Studios and as a house engineer at The Brain Studios. He's currently operating out of his home production space and when necessary, out of several larger studios around Sydney, Australia. Matt has worked with Gay Paris, Darker Half, To The Grave and Demon Fotel Harvest, as well as having worked on records that have been mixed by engineers like Sampura and Dan Swano. Matt was also the founding member and bass player of the deathcore band To The Grave, and has toured throughout Australia. He is currently the bass player in Blackened Thrash and Roll Bastardizer, with whom he has toured internationally. I first came upon Matt in a mutual Facebook community, where he shared some sage advice with me, and we have since been Facebook friends. I've been meaning to get some metal producers on the show, and I thought Matt would be a great addition. So with all that said, welcome to Secret Sonics, Matt. Hey, Ben. How's it going today? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for joining us. So tell us a bit about how you got started getting involved in music production. I think it starts pretty much the same as for everybody. Uh, I was playing in bands, um, started to take that a little more seriously after high school, and I've heard the same story from a couple of other engineers. You just, your first recordings are never very good. Yeah. The band's inexperienced. You don't have a lot of money and it never quite lives up to the, to your expectation and your dream of what your album is going to sound like. And I started getting more interested in, in how to fulfill that vision. And uh, yeah, it went from there. Amazing. Was there a song or album that really opened your mind to the possibilities of what could be accomplished with production? Uh, I think I'd always been interested in music and especially uh, in my teenage years, getting more into to heavy music and, and being a little obsessive about, you know, oh, that guitarist is using that amp and, the, you know, that bass player uses that gear. And it just sort of snowballs from there. Um, I was thinking about it today in preparation for coming on here. And I think it was... Um, I think the first record I noticed that sounded great was Reload by Metallica, mm-hmm. which is you know one of the Bob Rock productions that he did for that band. Which which just, year did that album come out? That was ninety seven. Okay, yeah. And I th- I think that was like that was the the first big heavy riff I heard as well. It was uh, the song Fuel came on the radio and I just lost my mind and <laughs> was hooked ever since. <laughs> Love it. So that that's that's where it all starts. That's kind of that was kind of that like eye opening experience where it's like, oh wow, this is it. Yeah, this oh. is it. Yeah, definitely amazing. So today, you know, you're living in Sydney and you're working with all kinds of bands. What do you look for in a in an artist uh, or band? I guess when you're trying to see if it'll be a good fit working together. Mostly that they're ready to make something a little more serious. I think working with a band who's it's their first time ever recording anything can be a bit rough on both sides. You know, the the band's very green, they're, they're nervous, they, their playing might not be up to scratch to, to deliver on, on what they want. And if they're going to have somebody push them around a little or, or, or break some of their illusions about what goes into making you know, a real record, uh, it can be kind of hard on them to have those sort of illusions shattered (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) you know that there's that their that their favorite record you know that the drums were edited on that that favorite record of theirs or that the the guitarist doesn't use the the amp that he's in the guitar magazine advertising yeah so so once a band's beyond that sort of first first recording stage and they're looking to do something that sounds a bit a bit bigger and tighter just a band that's got cool songs yeah you know, if, if we're going to be working for a week, two weeks, a month on a record, you want it to be something that that you can get into and connect with. Yeah. And and hopefully, you know, dig out more of, of what makes that band unique. That's that's another important thing as well. Like I, I never really want to work with just the same type of band over and over, you know, who just want to sound like the last thing that, that you did for, for a different band. Yeah, you like to mix it up a bit. Yeah, a bit. I mean, I'm mostly working with you know, heavy bands. That that's a very broad 
term these days. There's all these little subgenres that are very defined in their production aesthetic. You know, everything from super slick, almost pop records that just happen to have guitars, but everything else is quantized and auto-tuned and mm-hmm. and replaced through to stuff that sounds like it was recorded in a lounge room. Yeah. And all of that is is within this broader spectrum. So sure. dipping dipping into all of those different subgenres is pretty fun. Wow, I love that. That's great. Yeah. So uh, what, what's the first thing you listen for when you're hearing a song? And that said, do you prefer to hear like a demo or a live performance? Well, I, I'm, I'm out at a lot of gigs and, and I play in a band as well. So a lot of the bands I come across are from being at shows or playing shows. Yeah, casual networking um, kind of thing. Ca- casual networking just by being around, yeah. Awesome. Um, and and with, with social media... You, you're normally pretty aware of the bands in your area that are that are active and that people are paying attention to. So that that's how I'm coming across a lot of it. First thing when listening to a song is just, is there a song there at all? Um, something that's kind of fallen by the wayside in some heavy music is song structure. Ah, interesting. Um, lots of these, lots of the subgenres now are just, cool riff after cool riff after cool riff. <laughs> wow. And it's like, okay, great, they're cool riffs, but do I want to listen to five minutes of cool riffs that I couldn't I couldn't describe the first one to you by the end of the song? Yeah. You know, that, that, I think that's something that a lot of bands could spend some more time working on is, is listening back to the records they love and going like, oh, this song does have a chorus. It does have repeating parts. It does have something for the listener to connect with. Uh-huh. And so structure, yeah. I, I guess structure and arrangement is something that you're bringing to the bands you're working with a lot. It, it depends on if they need it. Uh, some bands have it so dialed in that there's, there's, no, uh, there's no input on that from, from my side. And then others, sometimes the, the, the demo I'll get from a band that I'm going to work with is a, a guitar profile with no actual recording it's all just tab that plays back midi oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah that's that was a rough one i've had that a couple of times and it's like oh dudes uh, do you guys know the do you guys play it even like yeah or is somebody just t- tapped it in on the computer yeah as far um, as far as i know program metal is not a thing yet uh it's getting that way there there's definitely some stretching of that boundary wow um, no way there's there's some records that have programmed bass, uh, some records that have programmed drums. Uh, there, there's even some that have programmed guitars for uh, instrumental stuff. Like it might be a instrumental solo thing by a drummer. Yeah. And he doesn't play anything but drums, so he'll program the rest. Like there, there's, there's definitely programs out there to do all of it. It's wow. just will it sound as good as somebody playing it? No, nah. not gonna definitely not gonna have the same feel for sure. No, definitely not. Yeah, amazing. So, so what what does the role of a producer look like in the metal scene? It can vary. Uh, it really does depend on what the band needs. The way the way I like to look at it is somebody who can take the band's vision and connect all the dots to make it happen. Uh huh. So it could be the band wants a particular sound. And the producer's job is to know what gear is going to get them there, how much editing is going to be involved in the process to get them that sound thereafter. Some of the subgenres of metal are very loose in the playing and the sound. And then others are inhumanly tight. You know, the, the performances are, that we're hearing on big records are so gridded and, and looped performances that... um knowing how to get there is is a big part of the job. Wow, that's crazy. Um so, so I see you're working out of a out of a home studio and you're also working out of larger studios in Sydney. Um Yeah. What, so what stage are you at a big studio? What stage are you in your home studio? Do you do pre-production? Can you talk about like how that all comes together? Yeah, sure. Uh so pre-production is sort of a a hybrid in the room like I always want to go 
and see the band live if I can and definitely in a rehearsal and just just hear what we're working with. And it's a good chance to check out the gear they've got, get a vibe for for the whole band and get to know them a bit. That's in a way that's a bit more chilled for them because the, the practice space is where they're used to being. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they hang out there every week. It's a bit more relaxed. So you can go there and just talk ideas, maybe suggest a couple of things while they're there. And then we do a, a bit of like pre-production demos at my home studio here. And then most of the recording happens here as well. At the moment... I'm playing with this idea of doing all of the guitars and bass DI'd with amp sims in the computer. Yeah. So so it sounds like it's getting a, a, in a ballpark of, of the sound we're going for and then recording vocals here as well. And then at the end of that, do the drums at a, at a larger commercial studio and reamp all the guitars, which is playing the DI back out through a real amp and then yeah. recording that sound. Are you doing a lot of reamping? Yeah, yeah. Not really set up in the space I'm working out of here for recording uh, loud guitar amps. We're uh, in yeah. the middle of suburbia, <laughs> um, and I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure my my neighbors of young families and elderly couples would appreciate deafeningly loud distorted <laughs> guitar <laughs> at all times of day. So we we try to keep it quiet here. And, and I find listening with the amp sim actually you focus on the performance a bit more too, and it's just it's just me and the guitarist sitting here working on the parts. You're less worried about the tone. Yeah, yeah, completely not worried about the tone. And they, the band, know that we're going to do something else mm-hmm. with it. You know, they know we'll be reamping. So the tone that we're playing, that we're monitoring back while we're recording, is is kind of just a placeholder. You know, it sounds okay but it's never going to go on a record. I'm assuming you're using it as a reference for when you do reamp it, though. I, I like to get in the ballpark and just have it a bit more fun while we're tracking, but I'm not really expecting it to be close to finished at all. And you, and you find that the amp sims don't, don't quite do the job yet in terms of the sound? There's a few that are really close. Um, uh, the amp manufacturer PV make one that's a sim of their... Mm-hmm. amps so that's the one i've been using most of and it's almost there but there's some weird digital thing to it that that eq won't fix and actually makes worse because you you start notching out the weird digital yeah. resonances and then you your guitars are getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh-huh and so that you're fixing one problem but they still don't sound real right yeah, I, I don't think at this stage there's any substitute for a microphone in front of a cab. Wow. In front of a tube amp. Like, even 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 like the Kempers aren't getting in the ballpark in your opinion. The Kempers are probably the closest thing, but they're they sound best when it's a uh, a profile of a real amp anyway. Right. So why not just use the real amp? I mean, I'm not yeah, I don't yeah. need a rig I don't need a Kemper rig to take out on tour with me. I, I know bands that tour heaps. I've got clients that do it as well. At the end of that recording process, they're cloning the album tone to take on the road with them. Right, That's right, right. fantastic that yeah. you can do that and just have a, a lunchbox-sized box or a pedal board that sounds like your record is amazing. Yeah, but next level. Let's, let's get that tone with a real amp first. Amazing. It's kind of my vibe. Yeah, word. I respect that. I think it's it's all I think different genres also like the amount of the sim mattering is different. You know what I mean? I yeah. think for like a, a pop record using a, an amp sim would probably not make a huge difference whereas in metal like the guitar tone is probably the sound of the record, you know? It it's definitely a big piece of how of the finished sound. But it, there there are metal genres that are all digital, you know, it's Right, it's, uh, yeah, Axe effects, guitar tones, program drums, program bass. The only real thing is the the, the vocalist, yeah. and that's 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 fine. That's got its own place. It's, uh, I'm just not doing a lot of that work. Great. And when I do, the bands that want that sound already have their Axe effects dialed in the way they want. They they have the sound they're after. 
Cool. We'll we'll run the DIs through that. 